Absolutely. There have been lines changed before, so that's good. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, a very warm welcome to you all and congratulations on coming to a kind of quasi-political event at the end of a week, which I think has probably left everyone sick and tired of politics. Um, so I congratulate you for your, your civic uh, determination. Uh, my name is Jonathan Hill. I'm a retired member of the St. Olaf faculty. I'm also a member of the local group Northfielders for Justice in Palestine, Israel. And it's in that capacity that I'm introducing our speaker this evening. Now, I'm going to make an unusual and slightly embarrassing request for many of you who like to remain in the shadows at the back. But would you consider moving forward? No. OK. <laughs> I made my effort. Stay where you are then. And let me start with some preliminary uh, acknowledgments and comments. Uh, Grant Smith's visit has been sponsored not only by NJP, but also by the St. Olaf Department of Sociology and Anthropology and by the St. Olaf Middle Eastern Studies Program. We owe a special thanks to Ipsatam al Atiat, who teaches in both the department and the program for the help that she's given us in making this event possible. Uh, the event is also sponsored by the St. Olaf student organization Olis for Justice in Palestine and by its counterpart across town, Carlton Students for Justice in Palestine, and we thank them both uh, very warmly. When you came in, you saw on the table outside the entrance door various pieces of literature, um, and please feel free uh, when the talk is over to take anything from there that you wish. I want to draw your attention in particular To this brochure, which you can find on the table outside, advertising a trip to Israel-Palestine this coming year, June the 19th to 30th, 30th, 2017. Is this microphone annoying? Can you hear me okay? All right, good. This trip uh, next June 2017 to Palestine-Israel is sponsored by NJP. And we would be delighted if we could interest any of you in signing up and seeing for yourselves the circumstances on the ground in Palestine, Israel, while visiting, of course, in terms of history, culture, and religion, one of the richest spots on Earth. So that is a trip this coming summer. You will also see on the table copies of Grant Smith's latest book, which is this one. If you are stimulated by his talk this evening, and I'm sure you will be, and you wish to learn a great deal more about the subject, then I cannot recommend this book uh, more highly. Grant will be signing copies afterwards if you'd like him to do so for you. Finally, if any of you are not already on our mailing list, that's the NJP mailing list, uh, and would like to receive NJP information in the future, notice of events such as this, then by, whether by postal mail or by email, then please sign up on the sheet that should be circulating throughout the room, if not now, at some point uh, in, in the next hour. That was the sheet that was on the table when you came in. If you're already on our mailing list, uh, do not feel obliged to confuse us by signing up again. I was anticipating a podium. I first heard Grant Smith talk a year ago when I attended a conference he'd organized at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. on this same topic, the Israel lobby. It was a day packed with impressive speakers, but Grant gave the opening address, and for me, the tone and substance of his talk shaped the whole day. As we all know, discussion of Israel is often emotionally charged, rhetorically hyperbolic, even violent. Such is the history of the Jewish people and the volatile circumstances on the ground in that region of the world. One of the greatest challenges facing those of us who wish to arrive at a dispassionate and defensible stance on the question of Israel is to acquire reliable, unbiased, factual knowledge on the issue. Grant Smith's indispensable contribution to this end has been to provide such knowledge less on Israel itself than on Israel's advocates and defenders in this country. 
a large, well-funded, disparate group of individuals and organizations that in aggregate, collectively, make up the Israel lobby. In his research, he documents, analyzes, and assesses how the enormous resources of this lobby seek, and in most instances succeed, in determining what the American public see, hear, read, and feel about Israel. He argues compellingly that what Israel wants is by no means necessarily in the best interests of this country. Of course, we would expect from Grant this kind of calm, informative writing he gives. After all, he's a Minnesotan. He has a BA in international relations from the University of Minnesota and a Master of International Management from the University of St. Thomas. In the 1980s, he worked with the Minnesota Citizens League to investigate the use of tax dollars by public entities to lobby elected officials for increased appropriations. He moved from the regional to the national sphere and in 2002 founded the Institute for Research Middle Eastern Policy, better known by its acronym IRMEP. He's written seven books on the relationship and its effects between this country and Israel. His articles have been widely published in newspapers in this country, Europe, and elsewhere. And we're about to benefit this evening from his expertise. At the end of this talk, Grant will be most willing to take questions. Please join me now in welcoming Grant Smith. Okay, that's, are we good now? Yes, yes. All right, great. So two and a half decades ago, I was sitting where you're sitting right now, studying, looking at a career. He didn't mention I went to IDS Financial Services, big company, good job, corporate marketing department, looking at what people think, doing expensive market research, trying to find my next job, trying to look at what my career was going to be. And I think being from Minnesota has been an advantage in doing policy research as well. And it's launched me into an entirely different realm of public opinion surveys and analysis and gathering data and facts. So I want to tell you a story about something that happened two months ago at the State Department. Now, there was a signing ceremony for the latest in a series of 10-year memorandums of understanding in which we're going to provide guaranteed a minimum level of military support to Israel. Now, I, I'm not a print journalist. I write a lot of articles, but I did get a press pass and was uh, joined by other journalists to cover the event. But there were two ground rules. Number one, you couldn't ask any of the officials signing the documents any questions whatsoever. And number two, you could not talk to any of the attendees who were there. Now, I quickly found out, uh, listening in, to people such as Jonathan Greenblatt, the new head of the Anti-Defamation League, members of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, APAC, who the special attendees were. The press was in the back of the room, kind of behind some stanchions and a rope line, trying to figure out how to cover this event. The event was rather unnoticed by the general public, however. But many of you in this audience know that since 1948, the United States has provided more financial uh, foreign aid to Israel than any other country in the world. And adjusted for inflation, which it almost never is in the press, it's now reached over $250 billion. Now, if you were to go out onto the street this week and grab you know, 60 people, 100 people, and ask them what the biggest destination of the US foreign aid budget is, about, about a third of them would know it's Israel. Others would not know. Others would not uh, be able to identify even uh, the question, they would say something like, maybe Africa? So just over a quarter would be able to answer that question. 
But if you put the figure over a map, and this is not my chart, but one that did appear in the Washington Post, thankfully, you find out a few things that are extremely important. That this month, for example, is a very important month in this whole question because there was no publisher's clearinghouse check with $3.8 billion passed over to the Israelis. This is actually handled in Congress through an omnibus spending bill that occurs in December with a lot of other appropriations. So this money has not yet gone out the door, and that is important as we'll talk about at the very end. Now, if you ask a question that Gallup never asks, that uh, the other mainstream pollsters never ask, you can find out a lot of things about what Americans really think about that aid. In a poll that was repeated in 2014 and 2016, we asked the following question with some information at the beginning. The US gives Israel over $3 billion worth of aid 9% of the foreign aid budget, more than any other country, the amount is, with the results um, or the question answer and options revolving so that none of them is in this order. Most of them said, 62% said this year that it was either too much or much too much. Now this is a statistically significant Google Consumer Survey. This is the kind of tool that I would have dreamed of having access to when I was your age or working in corporate market research. It's fast, it's accurate, and it's cheap. And you can do things and ask questions that nobody has ever asked before. So it's unchanged essentially. In fact, there is movement from 2014 to 2016. Uh, it went from 62% to almost 63% disapproval. Now, you wouldn't have heard any of that in the speech given by Susan Rice and her counterparts at the State Department signing ceremony that I celebrated. They were talking about the unbreakable bonds between the US and Israel, and they were talking about how our security uh, is linked to Israel's security, but they don't mention why, and you won't find too many arguing exactly how. It's something the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, which I'll be talking about, used to do but they don't even bother anymore. So we did another poll immediately uh, after the ink dried on the MOU, asking people, the US just agreed to spend 38 billion in military aid to Israel in the next 10 years. In your opinion, how could that money have been better spent? Over 60% of Americans had higher priorities than funneling yet more military aid to Israel. 16.8% thought it was a fine idea, and others wanted to either rebuild infrastructure and fund a Middle East peace plan. But the majority asked this question, did not agree that it was a good use of our tax dollars. So as I was being hustled out of the State Department, I took a couple shots with my cannon over my shoulder, and I noticed John Kerry had shown up at this point. I noticed that uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the head of the DNC, who uh, is very strong on this issue, is circulating around with people. I noticed the special guests had their cell phones. They still had them. They were taking selfies. So as we were hustled out the linoleum-tiled hallway, we were given back our phones. And it felt like, and several members of the press mentioned, that they kind of felt like second-class citizens at this event. Kind of felt like they couldn't ask any questions. Didn't like the experience. I didn't like it. And it's also true that you can't really get any sort of official answers to some of the most important questions about this aid. Number one question, raised by my organization and others, is that we actually have, still on the books, prohibitions of US foreign aid under two amendments to the 1961 Foreign Assistance Act called the Symington and Glenn Amendments, which prohibit any US foreign aid to any country that hasn't signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. We can't give them aid unless the president issues a waiver saying that it is in the US national interest to deliver aid despite the country being out of uh, the parameters of this non-proliferation treaty. 
Now, only one reporter so far that I've been able to find has pursued this issue by asking State Department spokesperson John Kirby that in light of even more information, not that this information is really secret, why isn't it the United States, why is it not paying attention to these Arms Export Control Acts? And this is John Kirby's response. Quick video. So an email has recently come to light, an exchange between Jeffrey Leeds and former Secretary of State Colin Powell, in which he acknowledges that Israel has, quote, has, he says, 200 nuclear weapons. Um, and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty has not been signed by Israel. Um, uh, under U.S. law, the United States should cut off support to Israel because it's a nuclear power that has not signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, according to Colin Powell, correct? Shouldn't you ask Colin Powell that? I, 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 I'm not okay. going to speak to this particular traffic, and uh, I'm certainly so not going to discuss. you're saying Israel doesn't have nuclear weapons? I'm certainly not going to discuss matters of intelligence from the, from the podium. I, I'm not... I have, no, I have no comment on that. Okay, well, the, the email says, the boys in Tehran know Israel has 200, all we targeted on Tehran, and we have thousands. I mean, that, that seems to indicate that, that there's a knowledge of an Israeli nuclear program, which would make USA to Israel illegal. I, I think I've answered your question. Okay, well, let me, let me ask, um, is that, am I, am I, do I have the correct understanding of U.S. law that, that we, are, we are not allowed to support a nuclear power that has not signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? Look, we obviously support the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a legal expert on all the tenets of it, and I'm certainly not going to speak about the, the details that you've revealed here in this email traffic. That would be inappropriate for me to discuss one way or the other. I'm not going to okay. do it. There are sanctions imposed on North Korea in response to their nuclear proliferation. There were sanctions put on Iran in response to allegations of nuclear proliferation. And now we have this email from Colin Powell saying that Israel has 200 nuclear weapons. Why is Israel not facing any, any consequence for this? That's a very colorful way of getting back to the same question you just asked me. Um, but I'm going to refer you back to the transcript when you see it this afternoon to what I said before to your question. Right, so so you, you are, you're familiar with this email, right? I'm not. Oh. I have not seen it. I'm not, I can't speak to it, uh, uh, the, the, the email. And, and, and frankly, even if I'd seen it, sir? I wouldn't engage in that kind of a, a Yeah, he wouldn't engage in that kind of discussion. Uh, we sue uh, for a lot of Freedom of Information Act cases that go nowhere. We did not have to sue to get this document. This is the Department of Energy State Department official gag order on any government contractor or federal employee talking about Israel's nuclear weapons. It's called Guidance on the Release of Information Relating to the Potential for an Israeli Nuclear Capability totally Orwellian in terms of not even acknowledging. And it's developed from a State Department guideline that seems to contradict taking this approach. It says their own guidelines say, if something's in the public domain, you better serve your function and contextualize it. People have been prosecuted, including James Doyle, who used to work at a national laboratory. His home was raided. His computer was taken away from him. And he was fired because he had the temerity to write, frankly, about Israel's nuclear weapons. And the American people at this point, after Mordecai Vanunu and revelations that continue to come out uh, in other countries, they know, 64% know, the Israelis have a nuclear weapon. So, okay, well, a nuclear weapons program. So we're talking about here, uh, even when we put out aid figures, an essentially unknown quantity. Uh, President Obama himself has said that we're providing unprecedented levels of military and intelligence aid. And so because we don't know what the intelligence aid is, if he wasn't adjusting for inflation, maybe we're giving an extra $2 billion above and beyond the roughly $3 billion plus congressional add-ons. Or maybe it's $13.2 billion adjusting for inflation, which was kind of the levels back in the early 70s during the Arab-Israeli war. But the bottom line is we don't even really know how much aid is being delivered. We do know, thanks to Glenn Greenwald and WikiLeaks and good reporting about it, that uh, within federal agencies, many of them follow a doctrine now that Israel is extremely important and that the paramount goal of U.S. Middle East policy is the survival of the state. So how did that come to pass? Secrecy makes all of this rather difficult to research. And you see various mentions of this in the press about confidentiality over donors, about 
calculatedly quiet. My best quote that I've ever seen from an anonymous APAC official was telling National Journal that there is no question we exert policy impact working behind the scenes, but we take care not to leave foot fingerprints, and that impact is not always traceable to us. So not a lot of openness in a lot of this lobbying. And so what we're asking in the book, what we're asking tonight is, why, in so many circumstances, is Middle East policy so detached from the people it's supposed to represent? Why is it there bona fide debate in at least elite media and political circles? How did this come to pass? Where does the money come from and go? And why don't Americans even know basic facts that most other countries seem to know? I'm going to go through this really quickly, but we did a more expensive poll earlier this year asking the following question. Which of the following do you believe to be true? Israelis occupy Palestinian land or Palestinians occupy Israeli land? No one's ever polled that question. Well, in Great Britain, 62% thought that the Israelis were the occupying party. In Canada, 51% thought that the Israelis were the occupying power. In Mexico, 55%. Only in the United States do you find a plurality who believe the exact opposite is true. So in that sense, the United States is very much out of sync in terms of believing something that the rest of the world believes would be factually incorrect. And they also believe things that are not true. For example, during some of the most fevered uh, rhetoric about the Iran nuclear program, 58.5% of Americans believed Iran already had nuclear weapons. And so they were in the same state of mind that they were right before that invasion of Iraq, where they believed the same thing about Iraq. And that has consequences. But the question is, where is all of that disinformation coming from? Who's helping put that out? Well. We don't have Gareth Porter here, but if you really want to read the whole story about it, and I didn't write the book, read Manufactured Crisis, about the false intelligence that was circulated, about eavesdropping on US-led negotiations, about the rhetoric and the offer that Israel was making to any congressperson to, as the New York Times says, do whatever it takes to get rid of the Iran nuclear deal. And you'll find something out very interesting. But, we're going to go someplace else. We're going to go back to history, see where the proto-lobby came from. Then we're going to come into the present and ask what's going on right now. Not necessarily always in this order, sometimes jumping back and forth through time. All of these slides will be available, uh, as well as sort of the talking points on the irmep.org website by tomorrow. But when I say Israel lobby, this is what I'm talking about. In the book, we pulled the data, 4,000 tax returns on 336 organizations that were all 501c3 charities accepting tax-exempt donation that had as a stated primary objective the advancement of Israel from the United States. And so when I say Israel lobby, I'm referring to this 336 uh, member pool and their lobbying lead that channels their power, which is APAC. So that's who I'm referring to. And I'm also referring sometimes to some of the bundled contributions and PACs, but I'm mostly referring to the nonprofit 501c3 universe doing uh, all the rest of it would be truly an extraordinary task. But where did the lobby come from? In the book, I trace the history of B'nai B'rith, which emerged on the scene back in 1843. The founders of B'nai B'rith did sort of a market study looked around at some lodge systems that they really liked, like the Odd Fellows and the Freemasons, considered becoming part of the Odd Fellows, opening up a kind of new branch, but then decided that they would have a lodge system to serve the wave of Jewish immigrants from German-speaking uh, countries that was entering the United States, help them with integration, help them learn English, help them have uh, modern hospitals, facilities, orphanages. This was a social welfare society with a ornate and beautiful certificate of membership that said benevolence, brotherly love, and harmony. Now, 
by their own admission in one of their internal reports. They called themselves the most influential Jewish association in the United States and indeed the world. They began getting more heavily into foreign policy after the 1903 attack on a Jewish community in Tsarist Russia, instigated by newspapers claiming that the Jewish community had murdered a boy and a large number uh, of Jews were killed, their homes were destroyed, their stores were ransacked, the police and military stood by, did nothing. This was a pogrom of epic proportions. Here's a political cartoon from the National Archives or you have Teddy Roosevelt telling the Tsar of Russia, you need to stop this, this is despicable, you're a tyrant, stop oppressing. And this was also a major initiative of B'nai B'rith. Simon Wolf met with Theodore Roosevelt and the Secretary of State. They signed a petition. They sent it to the Russian government saying, cut it out or there'll be consequences. Well, there were consequences. In 1910, after a meeting with the president, they abrogated, uh, William Tapp abrogated the trade treaty with Russia. And this was a huge success, but it left open sort of the question of, which organization is going to lead lobbying in the United States? Was it going to be B'nai B'rith or a spin-off? B'nai B'rith has spun off other organizations. One of them, the Anti-Defamation League, came about after the uh, trial of Leo Frank, a pencil owner, pencil uh, factory owner in the South who was accused of murdering an employee. Uh, he was lynched and the Anti-Defamation League formed with stated programs to fight anti-Semitism, to protest editors, to arrange economic boycotts, to cut out this kind of behavior, correct textbooks. Anyone could join, give a dollar, sign a membership card, and you could be part of this new movement to lobby against defamation. And some of the early successes were getting Roger's thesaurus to so stop saying that a simile for the word Jew was cunning, rich, usurer, extortioner, heretic. So they had that victory. They, uh, Sigmund Livingston, published a book called Must Men Hate, in which he addressed common notions circulating at the time that Jews were responsible for the horrible Versailles Treaty that unduly punished Germany, that they financed the Russian Revolution, that they were controlling the press and radio industries, flooding them with propaganda. So he addressed that. This was the program. B'nai B'rith also spun off a more explicitly policy-oriented organization called the American Jewish Committee, which was established with a borderless mandate. They were going to influence US policy overseas. They were going to be representatives of the Jewish community, although they had problems really arranging elections to accomplish that, as they admitted in some of their yearbooks, to prevent any sort of discrimination, restriction of rights, restriction of movement, economic opportunities. So it was an explicitly global mandate of a US organization. Now, founder Jacob Schiff, a financier, influential on Wall Street, managed to leverage some of these powers when uh, he organized, when war broke out between Japan and Russia, the 180 million sale of Japanese bonds in the US. He was asking the United States later to mediate a peace settlement, very involved in punishing Russia through Japan. They managed to present the Federal Reserve from issuing trade credits. They pressured the Associated Press, do not write stories about Tsarist Russia without mentioning the plight uh, of Jews in Russia. And they also did uh, a great effort to sort of shape US policy after World War II. So explicitly international focus, pressure, and try to shape policy in the United States. Well, we still need to talk about then this other international drive, Zionism, of course, the publication of The Jewish State by Theodore Herzl, arguing that Jews really needed their own state to solve the question, as he put it, and the Basel program in a casino outside of Basel in 1897, which said, look, we need to start organizing entities to accomplish a Jewish state, not just write about it. 
the Balfour Declaration, a promise from Great Britain to establish a homeland without discriminating against existing population, and the formation of some of the entities that he writes about in the Jewish state, such as the Jewish Agency, which would be sort of a government in waiting, get the money together, and start pushing for the state. Now, here we have the formation in the United States in the Zionist Organization of America, the first explicitly Zionist organization. And this organization was drawn, uh, drawn up, organized in Pittsburgh, incorporated in the New York State Legislature, but still a subsidiary of the World Zionist Organization, which was a counterpart of the Jewish Agency, to create this state. So even more internationalist yet than the American Jewish Committee, their aim was to execute the Basel program. And this is probably the most prophetic here, do any and all things necessary. And some of their members took that to heart. But their initial popular membership drives in this country failed. They tried to get uh, a national roll call, a quarter of a million members in 1935, it flopped. They just wanted people to pay a dollar and become members, flopped. Another 20,000 membership drive a little bit later, flopped. Uh, or 100,000 drive, flop. So they, of course, uh, did not begin picking up in membership until the rise of the National Socialists in Germany, Hitler, and of course, the decimation of European Jewry during the Holocaust. Suddenly, they're the answer because they have a program to solve these problems. Now, there was a battle in this country to control Jewish Federation money in every metropolitan area that has a Jewish Federation. The Zionist activists issued a call to conquer the local federations, infiltrate the welfare funds, we've got the program. There are a bunch of plutocrats controlling these fundraising organizations. They don't respond to what the people want, which is pushing for a state. And so they engaged in a fierce battle to take over the fundraising apparatus, and gradually over time, they managed to garner a large percentage of the total that was being raised in joint appeals in this country in the name of putting together and securing Israel. Now, in my study, in this 4,000 tax return database, we identify, through the magic of SPSS, a number of things about these organizations. We have four waves of creation of what I call Israel affinity organizations. The first wave, social welfare. The second wave, fighting for the Jewish state. Third and fourth wave, protecting and extending protection. So the one thing to notice, though, and there's a lot of rather droll writing about taxes in the IRS in my book, is that there's a big difference between the organizations of today and the ones of yesteryear. Those tended to provide social welfare purposes which would offset government burdens, which is, in this country, the reasons why we give tax deductibility to donations for this type of organization. But it's become progressively less so over time. And I would say it's a little bit like this man. Does anyone know this man? This is the most interesting man alive. And he doesn't always drink beer, but when he does, he drinks Dos Equis. Well, the early organizations weren't always Zionists. But when the state was formed and it needed support, they started becoming Zionist. Some of them were very serious about it, such as Abraham Feinberg, who arranged Henry, or Harry Truman's whistle-stop campaign through the country, which saved him from certain defeat by Dewey in the 48 election campaign. He later became the fundraiser for David Ben-Gurion for Israel's nuclear weapons program. There he is, seated next to Glenn Seaborg, the American, American uh, uh, Atomic Energy Commissioner, at a dinner. Uh, he organized, before that, the purchase of weapons for Jewish fighters in Palestine to win a state. LBJ was the last president to be dependent upon Abraham Feinberg, this super bundler, uh, his, his uh, largesse, 
But he was quite a powerhouse, and he stated in his interview with the Truman Library that my path to power was cooperation in terms of what they needed, talking about politicians. Campaign money, very effective man, unknown to history. Some of the things that they were buying, this is the Jewish agency I was talking about, this foreign entity, government in waiting, included up to B-17 bombers, hundreds of World War II explosives, scrap guns, ammunition, sealing it up in borders, shipping it from New York to Palestine. And this was something that generated a lot of law enforcement interest and a lot less prosecutions. Now here's a man who's very interesting, and I've written two books about him. Isaiah Kennan, Cy Kennan. He started out uh, as a newspaper man, then worked for the Jewish agency to push for the state at the United Nations, and became eventually the founder of APAC. And he's like Abraham Feinberg, very straightforward in his memoirs. He said, the lobby for Israel, known as APAC, came into existence in 1951. It was established because of Israel needed American economic assistance. There it is. Unabashed truth. That's why APAC was formed. Now, how it was formed? That's a different story. They created an umbrella organization called the American Zionist Council, allegedly formed by the Zionist organization Hadassah, the Women's Zionist Movement, and a couple of other organizations. And they had this little lobbying and PR unit on the side. This was a Jewish agency-funded operation, foreign funds coming in with seed money to pay for an American lobby. Now, the transformation of APAC is curious. The founder started out working as a foreign agent for the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I'll talk about the Foreign, registration and, uh, foreign Agents Registration Act in a second. He went through the American Zionist Council. He created this committee. And then in 1963, for reasons we'll talk about, they created a standalone entity called APAC. But this uh, Isaiah Cannon was writing newsletters, lobbying Congress for aid, pushing hard for publicity. Here's a check or a credit voucher from the Jewish agency saying, oh, it's time to pay Cy Kennan his $5,000 to keep this thing going again. Uh, they had a great deal of trouble finding what I would call a, a broad funding base in the United States. And they really had trouble with the Eisenhower administration because what tax-exempt funding they raised, they used for lobbying, which is not it's against the law. So the uh, Senate ultimately had enough of this. J.W. Fulbright sent in investigators. They seized Jewish agency documents in New York. They found out the Jewish agency was funding this American lobby with a vast program that is very similar to what's going on today. So I'm going to start jumping back and forth between history and the past. Please read the slides later. I'm not going to read every word, but this is one of the documents seized by investigators in 1962. So, lots of secrecy still. For obvious reasons, our activities in this area can't be minutely described. We can't always say which places and individuals were involved. That kind of thing. But here are the programs, okay? I'll show you the plan, and then I'll show you Isaiah Kennan's reports back to the Jewish agency about everything great that was happening in America. Magazines, we're going to cultivate editors. We're going to get our message out. We're going to stimulate the placement of articles. We're going to reprint. When someone writes something good, we're going to order a bunch of reprints, pay the magazine, and then circulate them to important people. We're going to get into radio, television, film. We're going to cover for the Israeli nuclear weapons program. Even back then, they were very helpful in getting people like Drew Pearson and Jack Anderson, who were big names for their column saying that, ah, this Dimona stuff that suddenly come out, not a big deal. It's a peaceful nuclear weapons program. Report back to the Jewish agency. I think we have this under control. Accomplishments, Life magazine, when there was a big article about the crisis of Zionism, they sat down with the editors, said no more of this, stimulated a letter writing campaign. Uh, this is still going on. We got some documents from VOA in which a former APAC PR Flack, Josh Block, pressured them to get Rula Jabril, a very eloquent former MSNBC speaker, journalist, not uh, to get her out of VOA as a commentator. She's crazy. She's an anti-Semite. Nobody will appear with her. 
canceled her, got somebody from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Um, so that's Christian religious groups, very important. Cultivating them, bringing them over to Israel, stimulating pieces in their press, uh, going on speaking tours, both Christian and general audiences, 20, or 2,661 appearances in 1962. This harkens to the present, where many big donors of typically Jewish Israel affinity organizations worked to set up the International Fellowships of Christians and Jews, and KUFI, Christians United for Israel, Pastor Hager, um, Hagler, who is phenomenally devoted to Israel. He has large lobbies in uh, large lobbying and uh, events in Washington. Uh, they're insignificant in terms of the overall funding base, but this is an 80 million person segment who are dispensationalists. They believe in the return of Jesus in Israel, and they are very devoted and will vote on that issue. So the major accomplishment. The academic circles. Get bad professors out of academia. Boy, get those bad professors out. Uh, Stanford was going to drop Fayez Sage, but he was going to go to McAllister. What can we do about him? Well, we got to talk to McAllister. We got to tell him this guy's a bad guy. We better tell him that there might be public relations consequences against McAllister if this guy's brought on. Now, what does this remind people of? Oh, there might be a big donation from somebody at Reader's Digest to McAllister. Ooh, I hope that's not jeopardized. So, lots of monitoring of campus. Oh, we're talking back in the 60s. You know, Norman Finkelstein, he's not the first guy, okay? Steven Salida, not the first guy to face this. So, we still have this even at think tanks. Now, here are some crack reporters who dared to write a report at the Center for American, uh, uh, Center for American Policy Democratic Think Tank that major Israel lobby donors were supporting the Clarion Fund, Uranium, the video about Iran nuking America, tons of uh, ideologues like Daniel Pipes at the Middle East Forum, and they just basically said, hey, Here's a report, Fear, Inc., The Roots of Islamophobia. Here are the people who are funding all these outfits. Well, guess who doesn't work there anymore? They're all gone. Goodbye. So this is still happening. Plan's still in effect. And I'm not going to go through the rest, but basically, if there was a good hit piece in the Atlantic, there would be 53,000 orders for reprints. Oh, those Palestinians, they're intransigent. They want to go home. Hmm. Stupid them. So, Martha Gellhorn wrote an article, said, look, this is a problem. And the AZC Apex uh, loved it. They ordered reprints. So this has been going on a very long time. I'm not going to go through all of them. One of the biggest accomplishments is sending elites to Israel to write home about it, become influencers, talk about Israel at home. And they started off doing this uh, to fight organizations, particularly Jewish organizations like the American Council for Judaism, which didn't like the Zionist program, fight them, get them out of the media. And we're going to talk about Rabbi Elmer Berger in a second. And pushback. So stimulate people to write in whenever the American Council for Judaism, which was anti-Zionist, whenever they appear, get them out. And this is still happening, particularly the visits to Israel. So there's an organization now that nobody's ever heard of. They're educational, but they've never published anything for the public to read. The only major publication of the American Israel Education Foundation, which is a junket-oriented uh, offshoot of APAC, which brings influentials to Israel, over 1,000 in the last 15 years. There's more of their information published on my website because a disgruntled person gave me their briefing book. Uh, there's more information from my website from this uh, educational organization than there is from their own website, which I think is still one page. But basically, people go there to learn that Jerusalem, that problem's over, that it was already incorporated into Israel. It's an organization with no employees. If you go on an AIEF junket, you're going with APAC. So the things that were put in place in the 60s, the trips, the media, now, they're spread around a little bit more. The program's the same. Now, what happened to the American Zionist Council? Robert F. Kennedy issued a Foreign Agents Registration Act order 
saying because you're foreign funded, because you're not complying with disclosure uh, requirements for foreign funded organizations doing publicity and lobbying, you have to start registering with us and you have to start showing us your finances and everything that's applicable to this as the Jewish Agency subsidiary. The American Israel Public Affairs Committee, which was just a committee before, in 1963, splits off and incorporates and carries on the program. Gets bigger, gets more powerful. The Foreign Agents Registration Act is a 1938 law that was administered by the State Department, which said, look, if you're a group, you can be communist, but if you're getting Soviet funding, you got to declare it. You got to put stamps on your material. If you're working with Hitler, if you're working with Goebbels, you're promoting Nazism, you can do that, but you have to put that on your literature. Paid for by Joseph Goebbels. And of course, the deterrent is amazing. Nobody wants to do that. If they get caught, they stop doing that. The law has been watered down over time, but it's basically designed to take foreign funded programs and expose them in the United States. So, what, where's the Israel lobby today? We have these four waves, I would say, progressively less social welfare oriented, progressively more political, progressively more activist in terms of looking at what's going on, whether it's Campus Watch, looking at who's speaking out on campus, Middle East Forum, uh, Daniel Pipes, who are the bad professors, Birthright Israel, bringing young Jewish kids to Israel. Hey, isn't this a great place? Hey, why don't you guys get married? Washington Institute for Near East Policy, APAC's think tank, friends of the IDF. They held a dinner in Los Angeles a couple weeks ago. They raised $38 million. Why? More tennis courts ping pong for the IDF. Um, so we've gotten progressively more activist. The Lawfare Project sue people who are doing work in the United States with slaps, strategic lawsuits. And so when you crunch the numbers, you get a look at basically four categories of organizations today, subsidy organizations, fundraising and political action organizations, education and advocacy. Now, I don't want to throw too many numbers at you. The subsidy organizations are American organizations with one or two people usually who are sending hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases to a partner organization. So American Friends of Technion, American Friends of Hebrew University, American Friends of this settlement in the West Bank. This is a $2 billion operation with 100 different organizations. And they're totally self-regulated. The IRS does not take any interest in seeing if any of this money that flows out of the United States is actually spent on what they say it is. These are the top 10, lots of universities, but also Technion, the Wiseman Institute, both known to be working on, according to the Pentagon, nuclear weapons research and development. Friends of the IDF. They are a $70 million organization sending $70 million to the IDF every year. More interesting, local fundraising and local action. These are the Jewish federations, 152 of them, raising money, spreading it around, giving a lot of it to activist organizations for Israel. But they also have these political arms in each metropolitan area, sometimes several in one metro area, which watchdog the media, do state lobbying. They don't report any lobbying dollars for the most part. And they will even form candidate campaign committees for people they really want to be elected to office. The main problem here is disclosure. So although they're located everywhere across the United States, and suddenly they'll all be working on Iran sanctions at once, or they'll suddenly all be working on, hey, let's alter the pension law so we can get more Israel bond sales from the Treasury and the pensions in our state. Wouldn't that be a good idea? And so they're using the same model that the old American Zionist Council used. You've got a big Jewish federation that's raising money. And on the side, you have this little Jewish Community Relations Council lobbying, talking to politicians, going up to the hill, not breaking out their financials. And even a former APAC official said, yeah, we know they're lobbying a lot, but we don't want them to become public targets. So let's just let them do their citizen lobbying. Let's not make them disclose anything. And so this is an enormous amount of lobbying that's going on for trade promotion, 
do joint scientific projects, send the police over to Israel to learn new law enforcement training, anti-BDS initiatives. None of it's counted in any of these big figures that I've thrown out about aid. If they get aid, if they do an economic development project, not counted. This has had the effect, particularly with the Iran JCPOA, of tying down the executive <coughs> who's in charge of foreign policy. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have a president. He's supposed to set policy. But then he looks across the country and he sees that there are Iran boycotts. There is all sorts of activity going on in the foreign policy domain <coughs> that he has no influence over. So that's the president in a lot of cases where these uh, JCRCs are involved. <clears throat> Some of them are even going to solve the Israeli-Palestinian crisis, such as this resolution in California, which said, resolved, because we have such a large community here that we represent, of course, two million in California. We want to determine the state of California believes that Israel's borders should be determined by the government of Israel. So foreign policy making on a state level, who knew? Um, now, if you were to ask and poll the American people who read these resolutions, they're non-binding, but you ask them this question, Congress and state legislatures are passing resolutions that are basically pejorative to the Palestinians, praising Israel. Is that your belief, too, every year? Is that your belief? And most people say no. So where did these resolutions, who do they really represent? Uh, these fundraising and local political action organizations, the JCRCs, for the most part, don't separate their financials. Those that do, such as the one in my part of the woods, Greater Washington, for every dollar they raise in tax-exempt donations, they get another $1.58 out of a state, local, or federal program. So they're very effective at funneling money into pro-Israel projects. The advocacy groups. Here I'm talking about APAC and the other organizations that are vocal and out front on Israel issues. So at the top of the pile, top 10 by revenue, you have APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, the Anti-Defamation League, which has gotten further and further away from the anti-Semitism business and into the pro-Israel business, the American Jewish Committee, we talked about them, the travel agency for APAC, uh, the Jewish Agency for Israel, which has a presence here, the Republican Jewish Committee, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, which was formed in 1985 as APAC's think tank. And these are the organizations that are channeling, let me skip that slide, channeling the collective power through APAC's bylaws. It makes 50 groups members of APAC automatically. This is now the super AZC. Never went away. Except now, you have all these organizations that are part of it. It's not just ZOA. It's not just Hadassah. It's all these other organizations, including uh, WZO, ZOA. Well, they were already there. But others you may not have heard of, Active on Campus, Hillel, etc. So the establishment media is generally helpful in saying, oh, yeah, these organizations are representative of the Jewish community in the United States. And they do the same sort of conflation that you see in a lot of the Israel Affinity Organization's publications. And they really do claim to be representative of the Jewish community in this country, which is kind of strange, because according to their statements, ADL, APAC, AJC, the Conference of Presidents, they were all against having a deal with Iran to regulate its nuclear program. So that must have been in a reflection of their constituencies, which they would present as the American Jewish community, right? Wrong. The overall US support for that epic deal signed was 53%. US Jewish support, 59%. So what was APAC and ADL and AJC doing working so hard to overturn that deal? Well, they weren't supporting them. And actually, dive into it a little bit deeper, look at the Pew Research Center's portrait of Jewish Americans, and you find out some really interesting things, which will make you think twice about how you speak about this. Most of the American Jewish population do not belong to Jewish organizations. Most of the organizations I'm talking about 
have the word Jewish in their name or they're specifically chartered as Jewish organizations. So that's interesting. Most Jewish Americans are not at all or only somewhat attached to Israel. 57% have never gone there. 44% will tell you explicitly settlement building is a bad idea. So it's a bit of a Potemkin village when APAC goes up to Congress and says, hey, we're representing American Jews, so get in line. It's really only about 774,000 adults, if you apply that to the current population. And they, within some of these larger Israel affinity organizations, know this. Michael Siegel even told the Assembly of Jewish Federations, we're going to be challenged on these numbers. Maybe we should be concerned. So, who do these organizations at the top of the lobby really represent? I would say a relatively small number of Jewish American mega donors, boards of directors that are both stagnant and unrepresentative, and the Israeli government, frankly. I mean, that's where the seed money came from, and that is who they visit on a very regular basis to help coordinate. So, when you look at the financials, and these are somewhat harder to get, the Republican Jewish Coalition, 143 donors give 76% of funding. Sheldon Adelson, the casino magnate, gave 8% of the total. APAC, 1,700 donors give them 60% of funding. One single donor gave them 13% of their funding in one year. I'm not cherry picking these numbers, they're just hard to get from the IRS. The Zionist Organization of America, Sheldon Adelson, gave them a million dollars. They lost their tax exempt status for a while for failing to file returns, but they are just really top heavy in terms of donations. So, do they have these giant numbers? Has ZOA got 300,000 members anymore? Of course not. The governance is as bad as they originally claimed the federations were when they're trying to get hold of the uh, funding back in the 30s and 40s. Most communities hold elections to the board, but the donors really control everything. They don't even pre have a pretense of election. The people at the top of these organizations stay there forever, 28 years for the former ADL head. Mort Klein's been there for 23 years. Your average corporate CEO has a tenure of nine years. These stay on forever. So there's no real pretense of representative government. The evangelical organizations we talked about, um, Kind of the same situation. Now, I'm going to break this up a little bit, a little bit of time uh, spent looking at Stephanie Schrock. She is a fundraiser for political campaigns in the United States. She was at a J Street meeting this year and started talking about the realities of campaign fundraising for candidates. So let's just listen to that really quick. I started as a finance okay. director. I, I, I worked for candidates in the 90s as their finance director and I would come on uh, on a congressional race. I'm a 20-something kid who also knows nothing beyond the state borders, let alone overseas. And you thought about where you're going to go to raise the money that you needed to raise to win a race. And you went to labor, and you went to the choice community, and you went to the Jewish community. But before you went to the Jewish community, you had a conversation with the lead APAC person in your state, and they made it clear that you needed a paper on Israel. And so you called all of your friends who already had a paper on Israel that was designed by APAC, and we made that your paper. This was before there was a campaign manager, or a policy director, or a field director, because you gotta raise money before you do all that. I have written more Israel papers than you can imagine. I'm from Montana. I barely <laughs> knew where Israel was until I looked at a map. And the poor campaign manager would come in or the policy director and I'd be like, here's your paper on Israel. This is our policy. We've sent it all over the country because this is how we've raised money. And so, and so oh, you oh, ask, oh. what does that mean? That means these candidates who you know, were farmers or school teachers or business women uh, ended up having an Israel pa position without having any significant conversation. But you're saying all Israel papers were the same. They were, were identical. Very similar. Okay, very similar. Imagine that. 
So this is the current, as of 2012, state of Israel affinity organizations in America. Two, million, or two billion dollars flowing overseas to Israel partners. Fundraising local political action, 26% of the pie, a billion dollars. Advocacy, 404 million. Education, which we're not gonna talk about too much, 317 million. Now the education, indoctrination, it's all about making sure that the Zionist spirit is still present in day schools, reaching out to Americans, talking about counter-extremism, talking about the Holocaust, and putting out education that's favorable to the Israel promotion. And so, again, it's not the biggest part of the pie, the segmentation. But together, what we can see is it's a lot of money. If you do a forecast using you know, regular uh, forecasting techniques, you get up to about uh, $6.3 billion using geometric smoothing out in 2020. And this is a growing uh, piece of the American charitable pie. And it's steady growth for the most part, absent the 2008 financial crisis. It puts, because of the tax deductible treatment of donations, the burdens transferred to other taxpayers. So by the end of the, well, by 2020, it's going to transfer about a billion dollars to other taxpayers. Uh, and so one of the things that's been deeply analyzed in the final chapters of the book is how helpful particular IRS commissioners have been to the project. Some have accepted the proposition that uh, Jewish Federation uh, fundraising needs even more tax-preferred status. Uh, Mortimer Kaplan and Sheldon Cohen were instrumental in blocking a Senate demand that they investigate and revoke tax-deductible status of certain organizations. And it's gone on and on. Douglas Shulman would not look into settlement financing despite numerous invitations to do so. And so there's a bit of under the radar awareness of this issue. In 2012 alone, Israel affinity organizations as a collective were already raising more money than the Red Cross. Just a little bit less than the United Way, two of the biggest charities in the United States. Totally under the radar though. Ask 100 people, hey, what are the biggest charities in terms of revenue? And they'll say, oh, the United Way and the Red Cross. They don't say, Israel affinity organizations? They're not going to say that, because they don't know. Almost nobody does. Uh, David K. Johnson, who threw a quote out, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who covers tax issues, uh, put in, uh, f quoted in the book after he responded to an email, he said, look, when someone gets a tax break of this magnitude, all it does is it makes everybody else pay. So when you look at some of the uses that money's going to, it's pretty interesting. In fact, it looks like a matching grants program. It looks as though for every dollar raised in the United States, the United States taxpayers giving that amount in military aid. Really looks like that as you look at the data over the last 20 years. Uh, and so you have to ask, is foreign aid just a matching grant? And it's kind of the reason why you're starting to hear people say from APAC and from elsewhere that this $3.8 billion is not enough. And I think in their mind they're saying, we are more influential than that. We probably deserve more like six to 10 billion a year. Just, they're not gonna say on this basis, but this is certainly the influence basis that they might be projecting those demands over. So let's talk about what happens to organizations that were opposing the rise of the Israel lobby in the United States. The Department of Justice took a stab at it, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the American Council for Judaism, and a couple of others, including the FBI, took a stab at it. J, or RFK signed the Registration Act order on the AZC. But the registration drive really fell apart after JFK was assassinated. RFK was out of the Justice Department. And basically, APAC was allowed to reorganize and reemerge. And this has happened many times 
The ZOA did the same thing. The Jewish agency did the same thing. They were ordered to register ZOA seven times, seven, <laughs> seven times, and did not do it. Justice Department didn't have the wherewithal to enforce their own orders. Um, when the Senate Foreign Relations Committee raided the Jewish agency, told, uh, held two hearings about it in 63, uh, the commissioners would not, would not follow up and actually investigate. Instead, they signed off on APAC's bid for tax-exempt status. And you have a counter-strike. They organized stealth PACs, political action committees, to get rid of Fulbright and the others who dared try to investigate them. And there are even internal memos saying, hey, I think we're going to get rid of the guy finally. So there's a rise of stealth PACs, organizations like NORPAC and Americans uh, for Middle East Policy and others even less descriptive, which coordinate and target candidates who won't toe the line. And when the American Educational Trust, which is a magazine publisher in Washington, obtained leaked memos of APAC coordinating these stealth PACs, which is something that a nonprofit can't do, they sued. The case went nowhere until the campaign finance laws had changed enough for the judge to throw it out of court. Rabbi Elber Berger, who was ideologically opposed to letting the Jewish federations be taken over by Zionists. He had solid backing, including an incredible donor and philanthropist, Lessing Rosenwald. But he lost the battle for the community chests. And they're still around. And they were very instrumental in helping the Justice Department and Senate investigate. But nationalism won out. The Organization of Arab Students was an organization on the rise until 1969. What were they doing? Well, they were holding conferences. They were challenging the press in their media failures. They were focusing on the Palestinian situation. Their 18th conference in 1969 had 200 participants. They relied on Arab heritage and years of membership building to kind of keep themselves going and keep themselves from being infiltrated. But they were infiltrated by the Anti-Defamation League, which sent in two undercover operatives, Baca and Eve, to their conference under cover of journalists to find out what their weaknesses were. And they were a threat. Gee, these students are beginning to display a much greater understanding of how to present their arguments. Red alert, red alert. Our campuses, there are rules against discriminating, so maybe we can challenge them on these rules that are keeping us out of their sessions that are closed. And this is a direct quote from the ADL report. We need to get an Arabic-speaking Jew from maybe the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society into the national machinery in New York. Maybe we can shut them down. Well, they're not around anymore. They're gone. Uh, the West Coast intersectionality movement. Not today, back in the 80s. Groups and organizations protesting South African apartheid, protesting Reagan doctrine in Central America, wanted to connect Israel-Palestine to the issue. Well, what happened to them? ADL agents, this is Roy Bullock, isn't he a charmer, came in, monitored, went to the meetings as supporters, passed out Holocaust denial literature, Oh, that was helpful. And then even worked with South African intelligence agencies to collect the information about leaders and try to get these organizations shut down. So there's been a lot of counter action, uh, sad to say it, by the ADL to take down these movements. The FBI has tried to prosecute, well, not prosecute, investigate espionage cases against APAC for leaking missile secrets to thwart a missile sale against Sam Halpern, a diplomat who passed trade secrets from companies that did not want to engage in trade preferences with Israel uh, to APAC to lobby against the deal. They tried to prosecute two officials uh, for leaking Pentagon data to try to get the US to turn from Iraq toward Iran based on the idea that they had intelligence showing that Iran was attacking soldiers in Iraq. Uh, none of these things ever went anywhere. One case, though, in particular, I'm going to talk about really fast, 
is that our first free trade agreement, giving massive trade preferences to Israel, was so important to APAC, they would stop at nothing to get it. So there was a huge contingent of American industries, sun-kissed Monsanto, giant industries saying, no, if we're going to have a free trade agreement, it's got to be more balanced than this, and it should be with the major economy. Well, they were overridden by a small group associated with APAC, mainly not really in the trade uh, business. And the FBI found out that uh, they'd stolen all of the data submitted by the opposition to the International Trade Commission and used it to lobby against them. And so what's happened to trade since then? Well, chronic deficit, because it's not a free trade agreement. It's basically opening the US market uh, to unlimited Israeli imports. And it is the worst free trade agreement in terms of the deficit since it was signed, adjusted for inflation of every bilateral ever signed. So a couple of major ZOA figures were involved in the NUMEC affair. Ivan Novik, national president of ZOA, Zalman Shapiro, Pittsburgh chapter president, created a uranium processing contractor for the Navy. 338 kilograms of weapons grade uranium went missing in the 60s, picked up samples by the CIA outside of Dimona. FBI got compelling eyewitness testimony that it had been diverted from the plant. Israel's top spies visited the plant at the invitation of the owners. This has been nothing but cover-ups and non-prosecutions ever since this affair became public. But it gave new meaning to this term that the COA would do any and all things necessary to advance Israel. So, what happened when the ADL itself was investigated for espionage? They had documents about African-American groups that they were in possession of. They hoped to leverage the use to show that black Muslims were a danger to America. Uh, they were investigated by the FBI. But after Israeli Justice Minister, Minister uh, David Lewall lobbied Janet Reno and even a young up-and-coming Eric Holder, the Justice Department dropped the investigation, told the FBI, forget about it. Yeah, they had classified information, but dropped the case. So, you know, these are two categories. You have civil opposition. You have government regulation trying to put some sort of limits on Israel lobbying activities. And why do they fail? Well. There, I would say that a lot of the lobbying that took place was very reactive, very focused. The non-governmental access groups don't have anywhere near the resources that the people they're taken on do. Uh, they were extremely, extremely, though they tried not to be uh, subjected, well, they were extremely exposed to infiltration. And they really didn't have the kind of, I don't think, research and awareness they needed to even launch some of their campaigns. Why does government regulation fail? Well, a frontline DOJ employee who's trying to enforce the Foreign Agents Registration Act sees the AG chatting up various groups that come in saying, we're not really serious about that. Just go away. We're not going to enforce it. That's in the documents. They can't count on any sort of media support if they were to leak documents or if they were to say, hey, we're trying to register some of these groups. Never got much press about it. And Israel affinity organizations, in the documents, they say this. Look, OK, you're trying to enforce FARA. But that was really for the Soviets and the Nazis. That wasn't for us. We're doing Israel. We're the good guys. You know, the letter of the law doesn't say anything about who's the bad guy. It just says, if you're going to do this, if you're going to lobby as a foreign agent, you got to register. And this act is still around. And guess which country has the fewest registered foreign agents? Well, don't guess. Um, so let's talk about today. I did this slide on Monday night in Washington. We were watching C-SPAN. Guess what we thought was going to happen? Oh, we know who's going to get elected. Hillary Clinton. And so I drew up this list of, well, what, what's going to happen on the Israel lobbying policy asks? 
And so I haven't changed this slide. And now I don't regret that because the ask is always the same, pretty much. So this is what's going to happen from, from my viewpoint. They're going to ask for a return to the no daylight policy. So when Obama, President Obama said, look, whenever there's no daylight, you know, you Israelis, you never do anything on the peace process side. So we're going to have some daylight. There's going to be a little bit of rivalry here. Well, that's going to be gone if they get their way. Restarting the peace process, because it's such a great thing to give the appearance of doing something. Well, actually not doing anything. They're going to ask for an increase in foreign aid. There's going to be an overturn of the JCPOA and lobbying for even more congressional sanctions and state level sanctions. There will be, and I, I honestly believe this would have happened under a Clinton administration as well, the US recognition of an undivided Jerusalem as Israel's capital and moving the embassy. I thought that would happen under Hillary Clinton. I really think it's going to happen now. There are going to be the same hardline policies against Russia, and perhaps the reemergence of Israel as the US strategic asset against demon Russia. Because this is in the DNA of the lobby. You know, we can see this. Israel's nuclear monopoly in the Middle East will be protected. The gag order will stay in place. There will be no meaningful moves against settlement building. There will be even fewer IRS reporting requirements asked of Israel lobby organizations. Given the rise of Hezbollah, there will be increased US pressure on Lebanon. These are what I think is going to happen based on just reading a lot of what's going on inside the lobby. There's going to be a lot of demands for national security advisor placements, State Department placements. IRS and Treasury have always been key positions to the lobby because they can cause a lot of trouble. Department of Defense, Supreme Court. And the core Israel lobby policy change or frames will remain the same. They will be Palestinians are terrorists, irrational, prone to violence, backward. Never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. The aggressors, interlopers, squatters. This is a great example of APAC honesty. This is from their newsletter about the Arab mind, a cartoon from the 60s. No compromise, double talk, blackmail, you know, no peace with Israel, world of fantasy. And these are the rational Westerners studying this delusional people. The core Israel lobby policy frames will be these. Israel is in constant danger of being pushed into the sea. Well, that isn't changing. The US and the West owe Israel reparations for failing to stop the Holocaust. This is the rightful homeland of a 3,000-year-old civilization. Israel is having common values with the United States, the only democracy in a bad neighborhood, inherently technology and innovation hub. America's cop on the beat helping us maintain access to energy, fighting terrorism, et cetera, et cetera. These will not change. The policy frame in terms of opposition movements, I don't think I'm surprising row two, will be these. Conflation, conflation, conflation. Sorry, row three. Conflation, conflation, conflation. Israel is equal to Judaism, which is equal to all Jews. Therefore, opposition, anti-Zionism, is anti-Semitism. Israel lobby policies passed by Congress are representative of legitimate US interests. Boycotts are righteous if they're against Israeli targets. Boycotts are anti-Semitism if they're BDS. Opposition to this is being a dead ender. You're going to kill your career, especially if you're young. This will go on your permanent record. Because if you're not on Israel's side, you're on the wrong side of history. Jonathan Greenblatt will tell you that. He told you that. He's telling you that. This is a tweet he sent out. BDS is a modern version of irrational hatred of the Jewish people. So think twice about jumping on the BDS bandwagon. And you want to be a winner? You an up-and-coming real estate magnate? Well, come on into the APAC real estate group. We're happy to have you. We dress nice, we make money, and we like APAC. So there's a lot of rewards and punishments out there. 
The Israel lobby does really well when it can operate behind the scenes, when it can charter polls to tell you what you think. It operates really well when the press is operating really badly, when Americans are too afraid to criticize, when it can get its political operatives into place, when influencers and up-and-comers believe that there's a payoff for going along and there's a consequence for not towing the line. The Israel lobby, however, does poorly when there's a lot of attention on what they're doing, when there's a mustering of public support to oppose a key program, as happened during the drive to bomb Syria over mysterious gas attacks inside Syria, when scandals erupt, when APAC espionage is detected and investigated, though not prosecuted, when there is meaningful and vocal Jewish American opposition, when the people who aren't part of the 774,000 stand up, when core lobbying programs are challenged in court, and when the alternative media starts driving mainstream media or just supersedes it. That helps a lot, too. I know. I've been there. So bona fide polls being conducted. One thing that uh, has happened recently is that Gallup is getting a little bit of a challenge for some of their polling. They love asking this question. Where do your sympathies lie, with Palestinians or with Israelis? And then they ask, where do they lie, Israelis or Iranians? And they get the answers they're looking for. But some of the polls that are a little bit more complicated, like the Chicago Council poll, are imminently challengeable. When they lumped in, well, you know, Mexico, Israel, Taiwan, American support aid to them, without even saying how much it is to each state, when in fact they're vastly different sums, and saying that, hey, Americans want to use force against uh, Iran if that's what it takes. Well, these are being challenged, too. So we've been driving a lot of these challenges from IRMEP, and others are starting to do it as well, because you can do it affordably now. There's no world values survey fielded in Israel. This is the gold standard that if it were ever fielded in Israel would show whether or not there really are comparable values between the US and Israel. And this will happen someday too. But right now the people who administer say, oh, we don't have enough money. What they mean is they're being held back from even doing it. But someone's going to do it sooner or later. A lobby, said Stephen J. Rosen, a former APAC official, is like a night flower. It thrives at night and it withers in the sun. And that's really true. And I don't know if you've seen this video. This is probably, yeah, this is my final video. But this is the Democratic National Convention in 2012, where they wanted to, with the consent of attendees, pass a plank on Jerusalem being and remaining the capital of Israel, and that it should remain undivided. It was lobbied for by officials of APAC, but this is what happened when they put it out for a popular vote. This is a non-debatable motion requiring a two-thirds vote. All of those in favor of suspending the rules, say aye. aye. All those opposed, say no. In the opinion of the chair, there's been a two-thirds affirmative vote to suspend the rules. Governor, would you like to make your motion? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this summer, I was proud to serve this party as the Platform Drafting Committee Chair. As the chair, I come before you today to discuss two important matters related to our party's national platform. As an ordained United Methodist minister, I am here to attest and affirm that our faith and belief in God is central to the American story and informs the values we've expressed in our party's platform. In addition, President Obama recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and our party's platform should as well. Mr. Chairman, I have submitted my amendment in writing, and I believe it is being projected on the screen for the delegates to see. I move adoption of the amendment as submitted and shown to the delegates. A motion has been made. Is there a second? 
Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, the matter requires a two-thirds vote in the affirmative. All those delegates in favor say aye. aye. All those delegates opposed say no. In the opinion of the let me do that again. All of those delegates in favor say aye. aye. All those delegates opposed say no. no. I um I guess I'll do that one more time. All those delegates in favor say aye. aye. All those delegates opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, two thirds have voted in the affirmative. The motion is adopted, and the platform has been amended, as shown on the screen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, Governor Strickland, thank you again for your service. Governor Strickland, thank you again for your service as chair of the Platform Drafting Committee. So, in conclusion, uh, through money, secrecy, misinformation, disinformation, constant lobbying, in my book, I state clearly that the lobbies gathered a harmful disproportionate influence over the United States that's undermining the country. Any effort or program to improve U.S. Middle East policy that doesn't address this it's not a, and is not aware of this uh, is going to waste very scarce and limited resources. But there are more resources today. Here are some. IRMEPs.org's website, our survey series, which are going viral, the Center for Policy and Law, which is doing FOIA and doing more lawsuits, the Israel Lobby Archive, which has gathered all of these documents that I've shown tonight and more, uh, which have never been made available. Most of them were never even released from the government before we went after them. The Washington Report on Middle East Affairs magazine, which for 30 years, published by two former State Department officials, has been talking about this issue. Copies available on the table outside. Antiwar.org, uh, where I also do some writing, and other extremely good writers on this issue, including their podcasts, are talking about this. These slides will be available at that URL, also linked on the home page. And I would also invite anyone who wishes to talk to others about this to our fourth annual conference in Washington, D.C., the Israel Lobby and American Policy.org at the National Press Club in Washington. This will be our biggest ever. Uh, Jonathan mentioned that there's always a nice contingent from Northfield going now. So join up with them and hear from a diverse array of thought leaders, not just from one side of the political spectrum or the other, talking about what needs to be talked about and how to improve a situation that's gotten worse and worse over time. This is not a commercial. This is an investment of time that is made by the Washington Report and my organization for you. And so with that, I invite Jonathan back up to do Q&A, and thank you very much. Uh, if, um, if you feel you have to leave, please do so, but I think we'll go straight into the question and answer session. Uh, if you would raise your hand, I will bring the mic to you so you can be heard by everyone else, and then uh, Grant will answer. So, uh, there's a huge amount of information there. I'm sure you're probably reeling under the weight of data and so forth, but I'm happy to take a question from anyone who raises their hand.
So there was a huge, a huge amount of in, uh, information. It was a very long and intricate and interesting story that you told. Uh, and it seems to me throughout the entirety of that story, the only party or people that ever demonstrate effective agency are the Zionists. Everyone else is played by the Zionists or bribed by the Zionists or you know, quieted by them or threatened by them, intimidated by them. I'm just wondering, though, whether it might not be possible that another alternate explanation would be that elements, predominant elements in the American foreign policy establishment, both parties maybe even, understand Israel to be some kind of strategic ally. And I notice you acknowledge that, but somehow you couldn't bring yourself to say the word strategic assets without putting air quotes around them. And right. I just wonder what kind of serious consideration you're giving to this very serious matter. Yeah, it's a great question. It's a great question. Thank you for asking it. I put the air quotes in because the historical record has become increasingly clear that during the intense argument between Truman and his Secretary of State and his Defense Department, that they believed that allowing this to happen would be a disaster for U.S. policy in the region. And so Secretary of State Marshall threatened to resign. Many of his policy advisors said, why, Harry, are you doing it? And he said the following, I've got thousands of Jewish voters and donors in New York, and frankly, boys, I just don't have that from the other side. That was in 1947, 1948. Fa uh, go forward to the Cold War. Yes, Israel would give the United States captured Soviet equipment, but when they found out Israel was going nuclear, Kennedy staged his most vociferous opposition to Ben-Gurion, saying, we don't want this to happen. We want to send inspectors. We want the program to be peaceful, not weaponized. They didn't see any strategic advantage to the Israelis having that kind of power in such an explosive region. When Nixon sat down with Golda Meir in 72 and 73, well, excuse me, in 69 when they visited, um, and said, look, we don't want you to talk about our nuclear weapons. We want you to sweep it under the table. Within Nixon's notes, he didn't say, OK, I'll do it because this will be our strategic asset in the region. He did it because he said he didn't want to face the Zionist campaign to undermine him. When you talk to people who have been in the military, uh, when you talk to Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel, he says every couple of years, the Israelis pull out some sort of initiative that makes the presidents hit the roof with rage. When you talk about, has Israel ever fired a shot in anger against a US enemy in the region? That is debatable. When you talk about, why did the US support Israel with massive aid in 73? Were they about to be wiped off the map? Well, no. But they were about to launch even more initiatives inside the US to get the aid. The argument that Israel is America's cop on the beat and that it's really the Defense Department, the military industrial complex that's pulling the strings and you can never really see it. You can't get any documents about it, but they want this. They want Israel to be America's cop on the beat. They're keeping access to oil open. Well, what happened in the Gulf War? Were the Israeli troops the first ones to hit the beach? take out Saddam Hussein? No, they had to be restrained. When missiles were raining down on the Israelis, the Scud missiles from Saddam Hussein, who had to be restrained from firing back because it would have wrecked the entire coalition? So I got to say that the argument that it's not the lobby, that this is a strategic asset, and that American the American security establishment, the administrations, the national security advisors have always been on board with this. It just ain't so. 
And if someone tells you, as someone concerned about this, that, hey, the target is over here at the Pentagon. These guys over here want the aid package. Yeah, those guys at APAC and the ZOA and all these organizations, forget about them. That's not true. These have been the primary movers and shakers of putting out the arguments, putting out the studies, forming the think tanks, pointing out the targets. It's about the lobby more than it is about some nefarious, nebulous US national security interests. And it is supremely troubling to the lobby to have a Chuck Hagel, to have a Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, to have these documents come out from the Nixon administration debunking one of the most cherished and sacred myths that's been manufactured by the lobby. So I put air quotes around it because I don't believe it's true. Now, you may differ in that. It's a great question. Let's look at the data, though. Let's look at the historical record. I'd like to know your thoughts, the good points and the bad points of the Iran nuclear deal, and then what's going to happen to it in the next year or so. Um, the good points, there, as a, non, a nuclear non-proliferation NPT signatory, now they get to be even more transparent. If they ever had a desire to manufacture weapons, it's not clear they really ever did. Well, now they can. The threats removed, it's an issue that has gone away for the most part. If you're the lobby, though, you don't want the focus on the occupation. You don't want the focus on Israel. You want to keep the, the targeting of policy and press attention elsewhere. The best thing you can do is get rid of it, whip up the fury, get people to think that it's an existential crisis. There's an excellent report on loblog.org saying that the Iran nuclear scare was the Israel lobby's biggest fundraising bonanza over the past 10 years. It really saved them from becoming increasingly ir irrelevant. You know, crisis and manufactured crisis, or real crisis, I mean, let's be clear, they had a really great argument for the, you know, saving European Jewry. They had the plan, they had the people, they took over ideologically. But Iran is not the Holocaust. Iran is a manufactured crisis. So the reason to take it away is to bring it back. So if you get rid of it and start whipping up Iran fury again, hey, APAC can raise money again. Hey, they can go to the state legislature. They can become relevant again. So I believe one of the reasons to get rid of it from the lobby's perspective is it's just not doing anything for them. So that's my view of it. And next year, what will, ha what will happen now? Now? I mean, with the new administration. Uh, I think the plan's the same. I think either one of them, I think Hillary Clinton might have gotten rid of it. I think Donald Trump will get rid of it for sure. So, but the program's the same. The lobby does not like it. It makes them irrelevant to have Iran not be a readily accessible bogeyman. So I think we're going to see Manufacturing Crisis 2, the sequel. Um. So the New Deal requires uh, Israel to buy, I think, most of its weapons from U.S. arms manufacturers. Um, and, and this has been sort of the um, characteristic of all these aids, aid packages is that um, it requires a certain, the clause are there to re um, purchase a certain amount of weaponry from United States uh, arms manufacturers. Yeah. Um, so is, is there a kind of Zionist influence that you've found? That, uh, well, here's the deal. If you take the financials of the top five 
arms manufacturers. Uh, it's, it's a bunch of money, and the Israel portion of it's about 3%. So the fact that the Israelis were able to spend 26% on their own military industrial complex, which is highly export-oriented, so they can really build up an export base, they don't like that, but that's why they're suddenly opening up affiliates uh, of the Israeli companies as U.S. affiliates. So you see that with Israeli Aerospace Industries and Elbit and some others. So I don't think it matters. I think they're going to get around it. But I hear this argument all the time. It's the military industrial complex. They want to sell these weapons to Israel and make you pay for it. It's a tiny fraction of their total annual revenue. It's 3%. So do you see them at the State Department signing ceremonies? I didn't see any of them. There were some lower level guys there for selfies, but no generals. Do they go out? Does Lockheed Martin go up on the hill? Do they put out press releases saying, we got to do this Israel deal? No, they're not in the lead here. It's such a tiny amount of their overall revenues that someone who says this is an initiative by the military industrial complex, they just don't have the numbers. So I wrote a piece about this, and if you just Google uh, uh, MOU and Raytheon Boeing, you'll find it. The numbers are there, and they just don't support that argument that this is about arms sales. It's, it's just not enough. Someone else had a question over here? No, oh, that guy. The thing is, Iran hasn't attacked another country in a couple hundred years, isn't that correct? Yes. And aren't they surrounded by nuclear-powered countries, Russia to the north, India and, and Pakistan to the southeast, Iraq and, and, Pakistan and Afghanistan to the west? That's us. We're there. Why wouldn't they want a nuke? But the fact that they want one doesn't suggest they'd use one. They've never attacked anybody else in 200 years. The attacks have been us against them. We supplied Saddam Hussein with weapons and money. There's a picture of, of Vice President Cheney shaking hands with Saddam Hussein and handing him whatever he was handing him. We started, we helped the Iraqis start the war between Iran and Iraq. We probably also supplied the mustard gas that they would use. I don't know about that, but I know who started the war. And there was a question there? I'm just kidding. No, yeah, no. so no, that, I mean, that's... I do have a question. Oh, okay. Not about that one. The question <laughs> is this. The, uh, the wonderful Jewish people represent 2.2% of the United States population of 330 approximately million people. So my question is, this takeover that they, that they have engineered, which started after the Second World War, they controlled the media by mid-70s. By 1975, they had control of our media. Now they have a lockstep control of the media and using the media and the funds that they garnered from it, they have taken control of the House, the Senate. Who's they? Yeah, that, okay, so let's, yeah, let's break it down. One, one of the things I didn't get to, and I think I hear, I hear the 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 groundwork here. Well, excuse me, but they... I would like to respond real quick. I think with it when you say the Jewish lobby, and at one of our conferences we had an APAC guy up there with two congressmen, and he said, you know what? Like I'm not in there anymore, and I really oppose most of what they do. So when you say the Jewish lobby, and you include everybody, when you're really talking about a relatively small segment that's really pushing this initiative, and this is Pew Charitable Trust, you're really kind of alienating 
a whole host of allies who really oppose this kind of stuff. And so I would encourage people to be specific in saying people who are Israel lobbyists, people who are Israel affinity group members. And I, I would also say that there is a, a recognition um, of a substantial influence pushing uh, the Israel agenda in the press. There's commentary about it in the Jewish Daily Forward, Brooke Gladstone and her uh, Robert Garfield talk about it on takes on, on the press critics show. I mean, yeah, there are a lot of writers. Jeffrey Goldberg's prominent editor of, you know, The Atlantic magazine. But I think it helps to be, I think Eisenhower said it, you know, you, you got to be really specific about who you're talking about. Otherwise, you're really going to alienate people who are, whether you even know it or not, your allies. So I, I, I would encourage people to be just like MJ Rosenberg, the former APAC guy who says, I'm opposed to it now, and here I am at your conference talking about it. He said, don't talk about the Jewish lobby. Talk about the Israel lobby. And talk about what they're doing wrong. So I encourage that. As far as Kermit Roosevelt and the overthrow of Mossadegh in 1953, it's a great thing to know about. There were a lot of reasons for that, but it was mainly Anglo-English petroleum and U.S. interests about oil in Iran. I think the U.S. has not taken responsibility for its policy toward Iran. The country's done a lot of bad things, motivated by a lot of questionable Dulles brother uh, machinations inside of the CIA and State Department. You should read Overthrow by Stephen Kinzer. We've been doing this in country after country after country. I wouldn't agree that this is motivated by Israel at all. So, I mean, let's be, let's make our arguments factual. Let's be fact-based. Let's not be too inclusive about what we're talking about. That's what I would argue for. No, I don't, I'm not asking for an apology. I'm just saying. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, go, I'm going to, in, in, inter no, I, there are other people in the audience, I really want to give people a chance to this question. Other, other, other questions? I want to um, also thank you for your talk, thank you to the people who have asked good questions. Um, you uh, take a position, it seems, on the connection between Judaism and Israel. And I'm just wondering if you've uh, uh, explored the nature of the attachment to Israel that Jewish people feel, um, because you, may, you have some, it seems, somewhat questionable uh, attempt to distance uh, the interests of the Jews uh, from the uh, state of Israel. Um, let me just ask you a question. Yeah, sir. let's do that. I'll answer a question. Do you think that the survival and the security of the state of Israel are in the interest of the United States? And if so, why? And if so, why? if not, why not? Yeah, okay. Here's what I think. Uh, just like I think it's possible, well, I already said it. it. It's, I think it's not useful to be overly broad and throw around terms like, don't you think Jews think this about Israel? Because we can find out what they think, but we don't have to speculate. This is a poll that I didn't do, and it talks about how American Jews 
feel right now about Israel. So when I say there's not this overall attachment that the lobby would tell us there is, it's because there isn't. And that they don't go there is somewhat indicative. That they don't want any more settlements built, that's indicative. That they're not members of some of the big organizations that are pushing. So I don't deny that some feel very strongly about this. But they don't speak for everybody either in the Jewish community, and they certainly don't speak for a lot of people who are not in this community. And to continue to conflate Jews, Israel, uh, it, it's, it's not standing up to the survey data. Uh, does the United States have an interest, let's just go broad, in guaranteeing the survival of Guatemala? Is it in the national security interest of the United States that the state of, you know, let's talk about global warming, that any state that's threatened to go under this, the ocean in 50 years continue to survive? Do we want to support Micronesia? I mean, some would argue that any state's survival depends upon that state, and that really, perhaps U.S. policy shouldn't be wedded to any state. George Washington certainly said there shouldn't be any passionate attachment to any country. There should just be free trade and good relations with all. So I'm not arguing this. I don't have a position on this. But all I'm saying is it certainly merits a data-based analysis instead of the continued conflation that Israel is a representative of the world's Jews and that it is in the United States national interest to keep it exactly the way it is now in perpetuity. I think that's it's an open question. Nation states come and go. Uh, national interests come and go. Lobbies come and go. Um, but let's look at what's really happening. Let's speak with a little bit more specificity and research behind us. That's, that's what I'm arguing for. I know this sounds, it can sound pretty heavy, what I'm saying. It sounds like I'm really, I've already decided everything. I haven't, and I don't think anyone should. But I think that it doesn't help to have a predetermined, preset set of policies and work off that and try and convince everybody else that that's right when we have so many problems. And when this particular issue continues, and I do believe this, continues to be one of the core issues, if not the core issue in the region, the Israel-Palestine issue, it generates a lot of blowback. So it, it warrants the utmost attention and care in talking about it accurately. One more question. Thank you. Um, after the election on Wednesday, I think there were statements in Israel about <clears throat> the possible end of consideration of a two-state solution because we had an administration that would support settlements. I guess the question I have is what vision do you think the Israelis, Netanyahu, or the lobby has about what that would mean? What would happen if, in fact, there was just unbridled settlement and going forward do we imagine expulsion of everybody who's left in the West Bank? Do we imagine incorporating those populations? What, what do you think that looks like to the lobby and to Netanyahu? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's probably the question. I think, uh, you know, Netanyahu, he's very pro-settlement. There's always talk about a crisis that would foment sort of the final sweeping people over the Jordanian border, the Egyptian border, whatever. I don't know. I have no idea. But I really encourage people to focus on figuring that one out. I think it's way, uh, way above and beyond anything 
what's just happened in terms of um, the new president and his coming administration. It's, it's so utterly unpredictable. I think people just really need to get engaged and think about what they would like to see and voice that. But I'm not, I, I'm going to tell you, I don't know. I do not know. I want to thank um, Grant for this wonderful presentation. Uh, Clear-sighted, fact-based, open-minded, and like all of us, ignorant about the future. <laughs> Let's give him a big round of applause. Yeah, thanks. I should just warn you that if you leave this building, you can't get back in. The doors are now locked. Um, please pick up any of the information I mentioned earlier, and Grant will be most eager to sign any books uh, that um, you might like to acquire. They're out in the lobby. Thank you all very much for coming. <laughs> Thank, thanks for that last one. <laughs> Let me off the hook. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Thanks for